Among the things that the Apostle Paul included in his letter to the church at Colossae was this comment from what we have in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Of course, he's writing to Christians concerning what they need as to them remaining faithful. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now that's something for which we're to beware. To be wary is to be cautious and careful and circumspect. To realize that the devil, as Peter said, is as a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. And he does so usually by some false teaching, either embodied by people in the example they set and we follow their example or else outright instruction. And this world is dominated by false philosophies and false religious doctrines. And it's incumbent upon us if we would be faithful and do the work of the Lord as a member of our Lord's blood body, the church, to hearken to these warnings and others like them and be aware of how they appear in our culture and in our society. You'll remember that when Jesus was condemned, that the chief priest and the council had no desire to do anything but kill him. You'll remember also that Paul at one time said, pray for us that we be delivered from unreasonable men. Well, if they ever were, an unreasonable bunch of folks, it was the council and chief priest there in Jerusalem, there was no way that you were going to prove to them, no matter how well you proved it, but prove to them that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was the Son of God. And you can see even further their unreasonableness when Pilate comes out, the Roman governor, and he declares he found no fault in him or anything worthy of death. And all that he hears from the Jews was crucify him, crucify him. He even interrupts says, well, what, what has he done that's wrong? And all he hears is crucify him, crucify him. No interest in any kind of proof. They want him dead. They're going to have it that way. And, of course, they did. You can see that same disposition from these same men once the church is established, the gospel begins to spread, and you see the opposition to the apostles and the church in general by those same men and other Jews. You can see it when uh, Peter and John healed the lame man at the temple, and then how they were brought in and arrested, and they were not interested in saying, well, you taught the truth and we just didn't see it. Like those people on Pentecost, that we're guilty and we ought to know what to do to be saved. You know, they charged them that it not be spread any further. And they even beat them, to make the long story short, and told them not to do it. But you see it uh, even further as Paul goes, well, first of all, just take note of Stephen in Acts 7. There's a good example of how he reasons with these Jews who have a complete background in the Old Testament, and he shows them the way and shows them Christ. But what do they do? Well, like a mom, they rushed upon him, gnashing under their teeth and drug him outside of the city and stoned him to death. No use expecting the Word of God to convert folks like that. But it was preached to them anyway. And then I was going to say about the Apostle Paul and his preaching. He had that kind of thing happen to him over and over again. You remember in Acts 19, when the church was established in the city of Ephesus, the temple of Diana was there. The whole city got in an uproar. And those, uh, all they knew was our great Diana, which is one of the wonders of the world, has been spoken against, and we can't tolerate it, and here we go. And uh, if you look into that, you'll see that many of them didn't really know why they were writing. And just something to do, and they did. I won't go into the details on that, 
but uh, what I'm trying to get you to see is what we're going to discuss this morning that's in our land has been around a long, long time as far as the way people deal with that which they hate and do not like, and they're not open to being taught anything different than what they want to hear. So I introduce to you what is called cancel culture. And I ask you, do you know what cancel culture is, what it is? We've seen that it's not new because if there ever was cancel culture, though they probably didn't think to call it that, that's what I've described to you from the Bible and the high priest and council dealing with Jesus, how they dealt with Stephen and how they dealt with Paul and others also. So the cancel culture is a collective attempt to harm the reputation, the livelihood, and social presence of people. And nationwide, it has to do with uh, hurting their products or their TV shows or celebrities that don't walk the line as they think it or employees, and you're going down the line because they have violated a particular ideological standard. Do you think Jesus violated a particular ideological standard of the scribes, Pharisees, and chief priests, and the council? Yes, he did. You think when Paul stood on Mars Hill and dealt with those philosophies of that day and time that he wasn't, uh, along with the paganism and idolatrous worship, that he wasn't dealing with those same particular ideological standards that were present and dominating things at that time? Well, there were some that were reasonable, some that were honest, and they were caught up in all of this. When they heard the truth, they obeyed it, and the church would have been established in all these places. And I suggest to you that's the optimism we ought to have today as the church of the Lord under the Great Commission to preach the gospel. You can expect a whole lot of folks to not be reasonable, not be open, and their ideal is to cancel you out. And however they can cancel you out, they will do it. And they have a lot of steam behind their engine nowadays because more and more people are doing that. Now, have you heard the idea of being woke? Are you woke? If you don't know what I'm talking about, that phrase was coined in about 2014 by the Black Lives Matter movement. It's not included in the dictionary. It means are you aware of the racism and the sociological problems in our society. Now, that doesn't say a whole lot, but you've got to realize their awareness and understanding is what they mean and how they respond to what they deem to be what is wrong is bad. Well, now, preacher, you're talking about politics. No, I'm talking about the church living in a world that's guided by those things that the church in the first century lived in a world that they were expected to overthrow these false philosophies. They were expected to confront these false philosophies. I remember the late Brother Warren talking about how that, how that they went into the seats of philosophy and they exposed them and preached Jesus. And they went among the synagogues and they went into the temple and they proclaimed Christ as the Messiah and Him crucified. They were not embarrassed. And so as we studied in class this morning in the back, no wonder, don't be ashamed is given to Timothy in his proclamation in defense of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed to be known as one who's a New Testament Christian, a member of the Lord's church. Sometimes things can happen to make you do that. But we've got to deal, folks, and we've got to live in this cancel culture. And advocates of this thing use all kinds of ridicule. Have you heard of Dox, D-O-X? Well, that's where they do all this publishing personal info about somebody that they think is derogatory. And they dig back and all your social media and everything else they can dig up and throw it out there because if they can embarrass some of these people who are very worldly themselves and uh, get them crossways of this, that, the other, they cause them to lose their job. And they will try to get uh, uh, bank accounts removed and get people fired from their jobs or not uh, destroy support for a certain person, our company, whatever else they can do, their intent is to cancel you out. 
There is no reasoning with those who are rank cancel culture. Well, what does that do to the church? It doesn't do a thing as far as our obligations. We're still expected as individual Christians where we are to do as the Lord prescribes. As a church collective, we're still to preach the gospel to every creature. And we're still to defend the faith. But I want to talk about some of these things this morning. Uh, cancel culture is an oppressive means of an attempt to control others. The idea of canceling a person or product has been around really for a long time. Maybe some of us who uh, are more conservative in our view of things, and I have to even ask conservatives, conserving what? Because what some of them want to conserve, I might not want to conserve. If you call me a conservative, I'm going to tell you what kind of conservative I am. I'm conserving the idea of the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the Bible is infallible, inerrant, all sufficient, final revelation of God to man, and that we must be saved by Christ. And I can tell you, that's what I conserve. And I conserve those things governing my life. Well, you know, that may even put me in opposition to Republicans. So I'm not advocating Republicans, Democrats, or mole rats. There's bound to be somebody out there that has a party of mole rats. But anyway, I'm not for that. I'm simply saying, when I say I'm conservative, you know what I'm conserving. So when somebody says they're liberal, I have to know, well, why are you liberal? I like liberal givers, and so does the Lord. But I don't like those who loose us from what God and his authorized standard binds upon us. Thus, we need to know something about these things. So the idea of canceling a person or product has been around a long time. And conservatives, you see how general conservative can be, and non-conservatives have used it, at least in this form, a boycotting. You ever heard people that are opposed to all the general liberal agenda say, let's boycott this? Well, you're in cancel culture. You just don't know it. It's always easy to call somebody else something <laughs> that doesn't apply to you. So we may not, or some may not, I never have done any of that stuff. Some may not realize it, but that's what they're advocating. Don't buy their products. Well, if enough people don't buy a company's products, what happens to the company? I think it shuts down. And the people lose their jobs. So recently, social media has given rise to a kind of, uh, shall we say, an unaccountable mob rule. And that unaccountable mob rule punishes those they judge guilty for all sorts of moral violations. And you don't really know sometimes what their standard of morality is. In fact, most of the time you don't. They will ridicule, they will threaten, and they'll even try and get the offending party fired from their jobs, and that seems to be running rampant in lots of places. I think I'm speaking to everything, even as it is at this present time. There are a few people I've noticed in the last few weeks, and maybe months, that seem to be saying, well, you know, this just not right. But uh, it's still the predominant attitude and the way that they deal with anybody opposed to what they want. I can remember the time when we would say, well, in America, I may, not, I may think what you're teaching is absolutely wrong, but I'll defend your right to teach it, or, because that's America. That's freedom of speech. And not allowed us to have debates where both sides can equally air it out and people listen. And they can study for themselves, regardless of what the issue was. But it's not that way now. If you say something I don't like, and that I can, I will thump you on the head and shut you up. Now, canceling can occur for not being on the right side of these kinds of topics. Are you listening? Black Lives Matter, which is nothing but a leftist, anti-family, pro-Marxism ideology. Did I invent that about them because I oppose them? Go to their webpage, read it from their own minds, and you see what they are. Then there's critical race theory. I know you've heard of that. And that's examining society as it relates to race and power. And that gets interesting as to what they do. There's gender identity. A person's sense of his or her gender regardless of biology. <laughs> I won't comment on Intersectionality. 
how discrimination and privilege manifest in a personal social framework. Now, have you noticed these definitions? You almost have to have a social scientist bent toward the left. I know where those definitions came from. It came from people like that. And you don't know what they mean until they set you down and start explaining what they mean. And then you see it as it's reported on the news. Then there's the LGBTQ. I don't know that they've had any others. And, of course, that's an acronym symbolizing many sexual deviations. Then there's just race and racism, discrimination or privilege based on a person's skin color. I know we've heard this, that if you are born white, you are automatically a racist. Why would they feel if I just turn around and said, you're born black, you're automatically a racist? James, you're black. You're automatically a racist. You're just born out. You're racist. Everybody, anybody around you know you're a racist. How do we know? Well, do you know the man's name? No. But he's black. He's a racist. Or you're white. You're a racist. But what about the other colors and the other ethnic groups? What they're saying is, is that racism exists only among the whites. Well, now, you're getting awful touchy here. We can't talk about things like that. Why? You're falling victim to what they want you to do when you cannot speak out openly on things like this. And to show as Christians especially, we're to defend the faith. And God's good book does not allow for such false concepts. None whatsoever. Sexism, discrimination of privilege based on a person's sexual orientation, whatever that is. And then there's just plain old socialism, increased governmental oversight with a decrease of personal freedom. There's transsexuality, the surgical alteration to change a person's birth sex. And I've already mentioned white privilege, the inherent privilege of society due to being white. Why do I mention all of those? Have you heard anything about any of those recently? It's because that's what's being put over our society and we're taught to oppose false philosophies. Those are false philosophies. They're meant to guide you away from the belief in God and Christ and the Bible and much of the Bible's teaching. Today, the standard that determines what is acceptable and what is not is a liberal pro-LGBTQ, pro-abortion, and so forth state of mind. Cancel culture is easy to understand. If you do not agree with the leftist agenda, as I've given you some ideas what I mean by leftist agenda, you can lose your reputation, your popularity, and even your job. And they don't mind doing it. The cancel culture of the left is hypocritical. It demonstrates an attitude of intolerance while it demands tolerance for itself. That's been characteristic of liberal thinking for a long time. We reserve for us because we're the intellectuals of the crowd and we know how to do it. But we do not allow you ignoramuses to do because you don't know how to come out of the rain. We will tell you how you attack. Oh, no, they wouldn't do that. Have you been shut away in a tomb, sealed off from the world for the last, all your life? That's exactly what goes on. We as Christians above and beyond all people on this earth because of the enlightenment we have from the truth of God's word should recognize these things, should see them coming, should know where we have to stand to keep the church belonging to the Lord and to be faithful individual Christians and to know that we cannot allow, as Paul said, these philosophies, these false philosophies to lead us away from the truth. This is causing a restriction on free speech. I found this survey done about a year or so ago, no more than a year and a few months. I want to quote it. I have the address off the Internet if you wanted to get it, but I'll read this to you. A relatively new Cato National Survey finds that self-censorship is on the rise in the United States. Now, notice self-censorship. Nearly two-thirds, 62% of Americans say the political climate these days prevents them from saying things they believe because others might find them offensive. Question, 
have you watched what you've said where more so in the last year or so than you have other times? And especially is that the case with uh, school teachers, law enforcement officers, public people in general. Their every word is being weighed by these people. I go read further. The share of Americans who self-censor has risen several points since 2017, when 58% of Americans agreed with this statement. Nearly a third, 32% of employed Americans say they personally are worried about missing out on career opportunities or losing their job if their political opinions become known. And that's exactly what's happened. So these liberals, as I've defined it, will take to the various social media, uh, chat forums, and so on to denounce and attack those who, for example, oppose transgenderism, homosexuality, gender identity, the whole LGBTQ thing, or they've been deemed racist on their own personal definition of what a racist is, or even support the wrong political candidate. People who support biblical morals and non-political correct attitudes are to be canceled. The following are some examples of condemnation. I won't read all I have here that uh, over the last several years that have suffered this. Pepsi criticized for a controversial ad that appropriated global protest movements including Black Lives Matter. Equinox, the Jim Club brand, faced a backlash after it, emer after it emerged that its uh, pie owner was holding a Trump fundraiser. Starbucks was targeted for telling employees not to wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts and badges. Nike released a shoe with the original U.S. flag. The flag has only 13 stars and comes from a time when slavery was legal. Uncle Ben's changed its name and branding after criticism over racial stereotyping. And I could go on and on. I have a whole list here of a whole page. There's some things that you just can't get people to understand. And the only reason, and Buddy said it back in class earlier, that the Church of Christ, as we stand here faithful, has not already been just jumped right in the middle of, is that, first of all, there's a bunch of us that have ceased to speak out like we ought to speak out. We've adopted a whole lot of these views because we turned the church into simply a social institution practicing the social gospel, which means you're just simply helping the poor, and that's the idea of all that Christianity is, and you feed those who are hungry. And they fail to realize when they read through their Bible that it's very plain that the gospel confronts the sins of people and says you must change to embrace the truth to live right. If they knew all about what I'm preaching today, they might be pretty well upset about it. And somebody will say about all these things I've just read, that, well, that's not fair to do people this way. But with the increasingly left-leaning morality found in societies worldwide, you know what fair really is as far as they're concerned? It's an arbitrary setting up, but we want it this way. And the sad part about it is they're in a changing mode themselves. That is what they do today, uh, five years from now, a year from now, may be completely different. What is the danger of this thing? Well, cu uh, cancel culture, I think you've already seen the danger of it, but it's dangerous because uh, of the damage it can do. It can curtail free speech. It's doing it right and left. Go to a college campus. You don't have to do that. Go to YouTube and look up these speakers that are, quote, conservative, unquote, going to a college campus. There's a fight everywhere they go because they don't, want, they don't want to let them speak. And that's the idea. We don't hear from you. But there's another side to the matter. There may be another side. We have our side. That's all that's going to be said. And that's just... Contrary to the truth, many years ago, before this ever came to mind, I was preaching a series of lessons in Muskogee, Oklahoma. The church had a 30-minute program every Sunday morning. And I didn't know if this happened, but the fellow that owned it, he and his wife, they were Catholics. And uh, I think she tried to be pretty active, but he didn't much. And I preached a series on Roman Catholicism. 
And uh, he called me in, the manager of the station, called me in. He was the husband. And he was very nice about it, but uh, he wanted me to tone it down. He wanted me just, you know, not to speak plainly on those things. I said, well, did I speak anything contrary to the facts of history or contrary to what the Bible teaches? Well, you know, just don't be so pointed. Don't be hitting. I said, look, the Church of Christ bought this time, and in harmony with the FCC regulations, that's our time. Yes, it's on your station. We bought it from you, didn't we? Yes. I said, so I can use it for what the Church of Christ does. Yes. I said, well, I'll see if I can handle this the next time around. Well, the threat had been we're going to blow up the station if you don't get him off the air. Well, that might raise some eyebrows. I guarantee you raise them today. So I simply got on there and the next sermon pointed out that we had people on there that weren't even good Americans. They did not respect the Constitution, and they did not respect freedom of speech, and they didn't want somebody that had bought time on the radio to be able to speak something different from what they believed. Now, we won't even talk about this as a standpoint of what's right and wrong for the Bible. We're just talking about the standpoint. I wish these people that aren't good Americans would just leave us alone and let us be good Americans and use our freedom of speech. <laughs> then I went on to preach my lesson. But after that, he said, when he saw me bring my tapes back out there again, he called me and he smiled. He said, you know, that was good. I appreciate that. And that was the end of all that. Don't know that it would be the end of it today, according to the topic that uh, I might be dealing with. But brethren, one of the dangers for us in the church is when all this happens, we draw up, as my daddy used to say, we draw up in a knot. And we're afraid to say anything anywhere to our neighbors or anybody else. And that's exactly what they want to happen doesn't mean that we should uh, not be careful and cautious. The New Testament's full of guidelines like that. But it means you can't spread the gospel and not spread it. So this can curtail free speech and the free exercise of religion. It can hinder, restrict, and penalize people and companies and ruin people's lives. And why? Because the cancel culture advocates, advocates find someone or something guilty of violating whatever their viewpoint is at that time that's of leftist progressive ideology dealing with either the LGBTQ, socialism, marriage, equality, abortion, etc. Of course, Christian principles, that is what the New Testament teaches, are not allowed, and, and they know that. They would not be for us. You tangle with some of these folks sometime, and you'll see just how radical radicalism is. They deny of... Uh, they deny free speech for people. They just, you don't have it. Well, yeah, but the Constitution says that. What do you think they care about that Constitution? They don't care a thing in the world about it. And thus, they're not going to care about anything that's an objective, static standard of proper conduct. They deny respect of those with whom they disagree. Uh, they deny open debate and cross-examination. They deny logical discourse. They deny that they might be wrong about their views. They don't care. That's what they want, so they're going to have it. They affirm punishing others for not holding the right view. They affirm that the ends justify the means of silence opposition. They affirm that they are the ones who are in the moral right, and they couldn't give you where their morality is they had to in a static standard of objective printed truth. They find people guilty of racism, intolerance, bigotry, etc., and punish them on the basis of their own whims. And as I said, they dox a person, which means they go back and dig up everything they can on that person to destroy their influence and even their own personal lives, families, and whatever. Those in the cancel culture cannot logically or philosophically establish a means by which their view is the right view. They just can't do it. And they're not going to meet in a situation to where they can be exposed and held up, that is, their doctrines, for ridicule. Now, I'll tell you one place this is hitting as hard as any, and that's in what goes on in the school. The people that control, what's it called, the national education, where are you teachers? No, what's it called, the national education, what? EDA? NEA, yeah, well, I meant to say that. NEA, yeah, they're as liberal as they can be. They're determined to meet the demands of these folks, and they're going to teach it to you kids. And if you don't have enough interest in your kids to do that or what it's going to do to teachers or godly people as they try to deal with this, I don't know, I don't know where we are. 
They assumed they had the ideological high, uh, high ground, and all who oppose them must be silenced. That's the cancel culture. But I ask again, what do they base their moral standard? They have no universal objective absolute standard of determining what's right and what's wrong. They go with whatever a society's momentum is at the time. And they want to be directing that momentum. Ultimately and finally, of course, we answer to God. Not to those who hold politically correct ideology or anybody else. They are guilty of what one has called progressive groupthink. Essentially, they're brainwashed in suppressing the truth in unrighteousness, as Paul said in Romans 1 and verse 18. What are we to do about this? Well, we're to live the Christian life and all that, that means. And the Church of Christ, as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, has an obligation to God and the world to fight unrighteousness in all its forms. It may mean risking our livelihood, and sometimes it could get to where we risk our lives. It just has to be. It's part of faithfulness. Our reward's in heaven. I'm not looking to be able to be, live eternal life on earth. Are you? If you have, you've missed a lot in the Bible. Present, it may be that all that will happen to God's people will be ridiculed. Well, the Lord's church has put up that before. I wish people would take some time to go back and read uh, Restoration History of the early years of the 19th century and just see what some of our brethren underwent from the denomination around about them as they took their stand to simply go with the book. And they were ostracized, they were belittled, they were kicked out, and so on. But they stood the test. We cannot allow penalizing and persecuting Christians to stop us from doing what we know is right. We need to be praying, Ephesians 6, 18. I'm just going to list these. It's living the Christian life. We need to be courteous, Colossians 4, 5 through 6. When you'd like to do otherwise, no. You love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 22, 39. You're to love them by speaking the truth to them, even when they don't want to hear it, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, 2 Corinthians 13, 8. And we are to contend for the faith. That's no optional matter. Jude 3, that's something we must do. We're to know the Bible well enough to quote Scripture when necessary, even if they don't believe it. Isaiah 55, 11. We must be prepared to support our views with logic and documentation from the truth. And you'll remember Peter telling us that if we go around doing what the Bible says, then it will not give grounds for those to belittle and to put us down and to speak blasphemous words against the gospel and against the church. And we must be prepared to be hated. Luke 21, 17, 17, 14. I don't think some of my brethren are prepared for that. Although if you live the faithful Christian life anytime, there'll be some of that. We just have a hard time saying, oh, surely that person wouldn't hate me. Go tell that to Jesus as you look up at his cross and say, why is he there? And know that he was perfect and flawless and never sinned, but there he is. Trust and obey God through whatever may come. So we need to cancel the cancel culture by living righteous lives and teaching the truth and exposing false philosophies and being prepared to suffer for the cause of Christ because we don't know what lies ahead. If somebody says we don't know the future, but we know who holds the future. And we know what is truly moral, what is truly right. And we know what satisfies and pleases God, how to be faithful. So I hope this will cause us to realize we may be closer to a whole lot of things as to the way that the world of the first century was lived and what Christians had to do. If we'll just be what we ought to be and not be cowed into a corner and afraid to speak. That's must. It can't just be with me. It has to be with every one of you where you're going to be tomorrow when you get the chance. It doesn't mean, you, as I say, let me emphasize this, that you, that you don't seek to be wise in your choice of words. Jesus said be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. He said, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days of evil, so Paul wrote. And that means be cautious. Choose what you say, where you say it, how you do it. But be the influence for good on the earth that God intended. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become one.
There are very few on this earth that are really Christians. Believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've sinned and brought reproach on the church, and we ask you to come confessing that you've repented of your sins, and we'll pray with you and for you for forgiveness. And do so now while we stand and sing.